three kinds of believers. Number one, the Bible lets us know that there is what we call a natural man first and foremost. That one is not even a believer. In fact, let me put it this way. There are three kinds of men from a spiritual standpoint. So men are categorized in three. There is number one, the natural man. Say after me, the natural man. Don't assume you understand what I'm saying. Say after me, the natural man. Right? So the Bible tells us that there is such a man as the natural man. In Romans chapter 8, please give it to us from... Um, There is the carnal man. Let me just list all three and then I begin to deal with them and get them out of the way. So there is the natural man and there is the carnal man. Everyone say the carnal man. One more time, say the carnal man. And then the third kind of man is called the spiritual man. Now you give us Romans chapter 8, please. 6 to 8. We read verse 6. Now we'll read down to 8. For to be carnally minded, it says, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. You see that now? For it is not subject. It tells you why that mind is carnal. We're coming there. That it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Verse 8. It says, so that they that are in the flesh, and not that description for being carnally minded, cannot, not that they don't want to, that they cannot please God in that state. Are we together? First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. We read that scripture earlier on. But the natural man, everybody say the natural man. So there is such a man as the natural man. And the Bible says what makes that man natural is that he's not regenerate. Are we together? He's an unsaved person. It's a spiritual language to mean the man that has not encountered Christ. He has not gone through what we call the new birth experience. That man may be a nice man. He may be someone who is societally accepted as a good man. But the moment you have not come into Christ, by receiving the life of Christ, the Bible calls you a natural man. And he's saying no matter how good such a man is, there is a deficiency that he does not have the faculty of receiving the things of the Spirit of God. You know why? For they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. So there are many good people, for instance, who will listen to a good sermon. Perhaps such as I'm preaching now. And as much as they appreciate the teaching, it doesn't make any sense. You know why? Because when it has to do with the business of spirit living, it is not just something that is, is hinged and stops at the realm of intellect. There is an engineering that the Holy Spirit the life of God does to an individual that gives you the faculty to both perceive, appreciate, and believe spiritual things. And if you are a natural man, you are not saved. I can tell you, you can sit down and wonder why are people crying? Why are people rolling in worship, for instance? Why are people quoting scripture and speaking them? It does not make sense. The end point for a natural man is you become critical, you become angry, you become offended because spiritual things don't make sense to such a man. You will find problems with almost everything in the Bible. And the reason is because you are only looking at it as a piece of literature or an archaeological material like you have been taught or a historic material. The life, the spirit component within it cannot profit you. You will read scriptures like there is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is he that withholdeth and it tends to penury. It won't make any sense to you. You would read scriptures like, you know, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it doesn't make sense. How do you call upon the name of a God you do not see and then you are saved? The natural man. Our world is full of many natural men. Some of them are good men, quite honestly. And yet they are natural men. The destiny of the natural man, the man without Christ, is eternal doom. 
Let me press that again. The destiny of the natural man, the man without Christ, based on the authority of scripture, is eternal damnation. In spite of the good works, in spite of the sincere heart, it is the reason why Jesus, watch this now, Jesus came and made a way through his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, he opened up that way that everyone who is not in Christ can now find his way through what we call the new birth experience. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe that God raised him from the dead, Romans chapter 10 from verse 8 to 10, it says, Thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, the Bible says that confession is made unto salvation with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation let me pause here for a minute and announce again to our world truly a day is going to come upon the earth where those who are not in christ will be doomed for eternal damnation we can argue this we can create a lot of philosophies there are many intelligent dissertations debates that have spanned through centuries debunking this reality but let god be true and every man a liar it is going to happen one day upon the earth that all those who had a chance to hear the gospel it is the reason why we continue to frontier the course of the kingdom helping people understand that jesus has come as savior as an expression of the love of god to them the only solution to man's state that he is not even aware of it says for all have seen how many all aware or otherwise all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus has come as a mediator. He didn't just come to inform us. He actually died. The Bible says so. He died. This is the gospel. I just felt burdened to just press it so that we don't just brush through the idea of a natural man. Something is wrong with such a man, spiritually speaking. Something may not be wrong with such a man financially speaking. Something may not be wrong with such a man intellectually speaking. When you look at the natural man, just from the eyes of a natural man too, you can see an excellent man. Maybe an excellent father, maybe a well-intentioned mother, maybe a, a, an intellectually vast individual. But we are looking from the lens of the spirit that anyone who is not in Christ is not saved. He is not saved because there is damnation that awaits all men. The only remedy is Jesus Christ. This is not a religious idea. This is truth. One day all men will be forced to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords indeed. It is the reason why we spend ourselves, our lives and we are spent to help the nations to see that there is a way out. This is not a ministry assignment. This is not a religious fanatic assignment. It is a matter of urgency. I told you the greatest need of an unbeliever is not accommodation. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not education. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not even solving their hunger problem at the moment. All those are profitable, but the greatest need of an unbeliever is introducing him to Jesus and praying that he or she out of their will will accept this substitutionary sacrifice he who has the son has eternal life he who has the son has eternal life only he who has the son has eternal life i have the son so I have eternal life. You see that? So there is such a man called the natural man. He can be the natural man as a distinguished professor. The natural man as an intellectual. The natural man as a successful career person. The natural man as a mentor to heads of state and heads of government. A natural man as a millionaire and a billionaire. A natural man as an inventor that is true but from a spiritual standpoint 
any man that is not without that is without the Christ unregenerate is called the natural man it is not an insult is the description of a spiritual state that is in need of urgent attention now for those of you who have been involved in any kind of charity or humanitarian work when you go to places that are really impoverished the health standards really low below average did you know that sometimes you can see the little children running around no shoes no no shirts playing football around and you see all kinds of sicknesses maybe sores maybe you know eczema or something on the children they are not even aware they are sick are we together because that level of life does not even afford them the privilege of awareness it is when the doctors or the medical people the missionaries come in as soon as you look at the children some of those children have they are they are sick to a point they are almost dying they are not even aware that is how the natural man is the natural man is not even aware of his spiritual state are we together yes so when you who is in Christ and have been given this mandate of world evangelization when you meet such a man you look at that man from the lens of this description that i just gave you like a compassionate humanitarian person looking at a small child malnourished the child does not know what is the cause of this lack of energy draining even unto death sometimes they administer you know medical treatment to the child immediately because the child is not even aware that he's just hours left listen if you begin to look at the world of unbelievers that way my life changed when i found a new name for unbelievers i don't call them sinners i don't call them unbelievers something happens to you when you call sinners sinners it puts you in a state of self-righteousness and you cannot win them jesus calls sinners harvest the moment you change that name it changes your orientation because in the mind of god every unbelieving person is ripe for harvest so he calls them the harvest i did a teaching on that you can get um you can go to koinonia global it was one of the teachings that we had in uk the harvest is very important so when you see a smoker provided you are seeing a smoker or a prostitute or some some um, um what they call it some occultic person what will come out from you to them is resentment not compassion but the moment you see them as a harvest then you see them from the lens of jesus like a sheep without shep everyone say the natural man in the midst of the thousands of people gathered here in this auditorium and all across and the many who are following i can tell you by the integrity of scripture there are natural men hearing me now there are natural men listening to me now well-intentioned people they came to church were gladly invited knowing that there is something missing in my life you are right it's a natural man but the good news is that the possibility of transition still exists that a natural man can leave that state and i'm praying for you in the name of jesus that you will not return back home as a natural man that if there is anybody here who is not saved when it is time for the altar call don't let the devil deceive you distract you and make you feel i think i'm ashamed i think i'm afraid the natural man has the eternal destiny of damnation it's true i saw the great and small stand before the lord the bible says books were opened and another book was opened and whoso's name was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire that burned with brimstone and sulfur the bible called it the second death i want you to know that this whole thing about the eternal destiny of believers is not a church concept it's not a pentecostal concept it's not a charismatic concept it's not an evangelistic concept in fact it is not even a christian concept it is a matter of your destiny before now that your destiny watch this now you came from somewhere i hope you know you did not just appear yes 
And the one who was there before time begun is the one who is making a way for you now to sort your eternal destiny. The destiny of everyone without Christ when our time here on earth is up is eternal damnation. When he, the spirit of truth, comes to the natural man, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Are we together? He will let you know that you don't need to be this way again. That Jesus Christ has come as an expression of the love of the Father. Number two, let's hurry up. The second kind of man that the Bible identifies is one who is now saved. Watch this now. Saved but not transformed. Saved but not under submission to the word of God. Saved but not under submission to the lordship of the Holy Spirit. A man that is driven by his senses. The Bible calls this man the carnal man. So write that word down, please. The carnal man. This is the second kind of man that we have. The carnal man is actually a believer. He's one who is saved already. But something is still wrong with that person. The administration of eternal life in the experience has not been furnished in such a man. Please listen carefully. A carnal man is not necessarily an unbeliever. He's one who has answered the altar call truly. From a spirit standpoint, he has received the life of Jesus. Are we together? But the outworkings of that life has not found expression in his life. And there are a few things that characterize the life of a carnal man. Number one is the absence of transformation by the word. The first way you know a carnal man is the absence of transformation by the word of God. Don't forget this. The absence of transformation by the word of God. He has not sustained what the Bible calls the mind of Christ. He is not spiritually minded. The carnal man has a mindset. In fact, what principally defines carnality is mindset. Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded. We read that earlier on. Is death. To be carnally minded. A carnal person is one who has a carnal mindset. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Such a person is still alive to self and the desires of the flesh. Write that down. Such a person is still alive to self. I have taught you that there are two things that you deal with as you sojourn this path of faith. Number one is a sin problem. Number two is a flesh problem. For the sin problem, you deal with it the moment you receive the life of God. You are declared righteous. You receive an imputation of the righteousness of God in Christ and that nature of sin completely dies and is out of your life. But as a believer, there is still something else to deal with. It is called the flesh. And for that one, you don't cast it out. With one salvation prayer, the sin problem is done. But the problem of the flesh can live with you all the days of your life, even as a Christian. Paul says, as, as touching the matters of the flesh, he says, I die daily. I die daily. Two, he says, I put my flesh under subjection. There is an active participation on my own part to keep my flesh at bay. Many believers do not understand this. And once people are born again, they just believe that because the sin problem is solved, it means I'm all right. No. Listen to what Paul said. Paul the apostle. When you read Romans chapter 8, verse, I mean chapter 7, Paul began to vent out his own frustration. He says, listen, there are two laws that are working in my members. Are we together? One is the law of sin and death. The other is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So that the things I do not want to do. This is Paul speaking. I find myself doing them. The things that I want to do, I do not find myself doing them. He was frustrated. And he said, oh wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul was frustrated. This was not a statement of encouragement. Oh, wretched man that I am. Why is it that I find myself is like another software that has possessed me, controlling me to do the things that I do not want to do. And the things that I want to do, I don't find myself doing it. And he said, who shall deliver me, even though saved from this body of death? Say the carnal man. 
I submit to you by the authority of scripture that a large percentage of believers are still domiciled in this realm. Unfortunately, for many, hopelessly so. Because the education, the enlightenment, the mentorship, the system of transition that graduates you to become spiritual in experience, most people may never have access to it. So you can be saved for 30 years and only transit from a natural man to become a carnal man and remain there. And keep questioning your spiritual life. Keep questioning your salvation. Because after 10, 15 years, you cannot see the value of growth. Nothing in your life justifies knowing God, loving God, serving God, living for God. You look at your life and you look at unbelievers and everything is the same. The carnal man, he still speaks like he used to speak. He still acts like he used to act. Are we together? Your impulses are fleshly, sensual. That many times people have to remind you and say, are you not a man of God? Are you not a pastor? Are you not a, a, a member of so, so, and so? You say, ah, don't mind me. These are the kind of people that one day will say, listen, let me tell you, don't think because I'm saved, I will remove my clothes here and beat the living daylight out of you. Have you heard people speak like that? And then others who say, this is my church mind. This is my what? That means there is another one. And they are right. Truly, there is another one. <laughs> what is the danger of carnality? I will tell you. The danger of carnality is that your life becomes a consistent misrepresentation of the image of Christ. Your life becomes a consistent misrepresentation of the image of Christ because you are carrying a title that cannot be defended by your life. You are carrying the title believer, the title Christian, but it cannot be defended. So your life, if people are going to learn God through the lens of your life, you become a consistent misrepresentation. Are we learning? Number two, what is the consequence of being and remaining carnal? Your experience in times of results and that of the unbeliever will not be different. Your experience in terms of your journey, your possibilities and your limitations will be almost exactly the same. The profit of your being saved cannot be demonstrated in your life. As a carnal believer. This is a very serious thing for many people. This is the explanation behind the frustration of many Christians. I'm saved now. Why is my life still like this? I will tell you why. Because you have not allowed the spirit of God to transit you. The potential of this life we have received is only seen clearest when it is viewed through the lens of spiritual people. To be carnally minded. And the Bible lets us know that one who is carnal is still a baby. Are we together? Let me show you a scripture. I hope God is speaking to someone. First Corinthians chapter 3, 1 to 4. First Corinthians 3, 1 to 4. And I, brethren, please write and let me have your attention. I could not speak to you as unto spiritual. My God. That means Paul is teaching us up front that there is a way you speak to spiritual people and there is a way you speak to carnal people. Are you seeing that now? Yes. It's the reason why there are many believers who cannot understand many things that are taught because they are still carnally minded. And even though they may laugh and carry all the gestures of knowledge and assimilation, the truth is they are not understanding what is being said because there are certain discussions that you really have to be spiritual to understand. Back to the discussion. And I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Now watch carefully. Even as up to babes, help me, the last two words, in Christ. One more time. There is such description of a believer as a babe in Christ. You are a child, even though you are in Christ. 
He's not speaking to people who are outside Christ. They are in Christ, but he's saying you are still children. Verse 2. I have fed you with milk like a mother feeds a baby. Milk here is talking about elementary levels of spiritual knowledge and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear them. Neither ye now are able. Paul is expressing his frustration. He's saying, I've come here many times and there are weightier things to teach you in the spirit. But every time I meet you and I examine you, that means there is a system for examining the state of a believer. You can know that this believer is still a child. Paul is saying, this is a lesson for men of God. When you go to minister to people, gauge, try to gauge the the spiritual state of the people so you don't waste your time discussing things that will fall on deaf ears give us that scripture i was not able to teach you i just had to feed you with milk and not meat for hitherto you were not able to bear it neither can you bear it now what is the proof of carnality verse 4 now okay well let's go to verse 3 verse 3 it says, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you. Now see all the elements of the flesh. He's talking to Christians. Envyings and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? He's dealing with the issue of carnal Christians now. If you look at verse 4. To end this, this scripture, it says, For while one said, I am for Paul, another, I am for Apollos, it means that you are still at the realm of men. Your mindset, you are not yet kingdom minded, you are not heavenly minded, you are still men pleasers. These are still elements of the flesh finding expression in you. Are you seeing that now? There are things I want to teach you, he's saying, but I cannot because I found out that in teaching you, I will waste my time. Even Jesus himself wanted to teach the disciples certain weightier matters of the kingdom. But he said unto them, I hope you know none of the disciples were saved. No, they were not saved. They were only being prepared. <laughs> How could they be saved without the Holy Spirit? Are we together now? Just because they were around Jesus did not make them saved. No. If they were saved by what means? It then means we have to cancel salvation. There is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. And salvation is only by the blood, the substitutionary sacrifice. So how could they have been saved? No. Everybody Jesus healed was still unsaved, including the religious people. Are we together? He had to die and become the firstborn of we the begotten. So he told them, he said, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. Ye cannot bear them. Not need, ye cannot hear them. Ye cannot bear them. And I've taught you here that some of those things he wanted to say was what the Spirit inspired Paul to write. You know how hard some of Paul's writings are? That even the disciples said, Kai, this one, ah, this man, this thing is hard, small. Low. So imagine if Jesus were talking to them. They would be saying, preach, preacher. And at the end of it, they would say, let's go out fishing. This guy is talking nonsense and wasting our time here. One of the ways you know you are still carnal is that you don't have the endurance for sound doctrine. The moment sound doctrine is a burden, something in you says, what is all this one now? Can't you just go straight forward? Receive. I'm not being sarcastic, but it's true. If I shout now and say, what am I seeing? BMW. Koinonia, BMW. Hey! Someone already lifted his hand and carried the hand of somebody and said, that's it. Now, I'm not saying that you receive it. Receive your BMW. <laughs> Are we together? But you see, if the entire journey of the believer is only centered around these kinds of things, there will be a lot of problems. And I tell you the truth, respectfully speaking, that we men of God have been given the mandate by God to transition people from being natural, carnal, to being spiritual. For as long as we keep maintaining carnal membership, the pastor will never rest. 
One of the proof of carnality is putting your attention on a man and not God. It's the reason why people keep going through all kinds of problems, even in ministry. Because if I tie all your attention to me, I will be in trouble. It means I will never sleep for the rest of my life. Are we together? So my job is to help you. And the greatest way to help you is not just to prophesy to you. The greatest way to help you is not just to pray for you when you are sick or be there for you when you have problems. That is very important. It's a very important pastoral duty. But let me tell you, the greatest way to really help believers is to teach them. Bring light, bring understanding, bring illumination. Grant them access to wisdom. The moment believers start growing and maturing, you start resting as a man of God. The same way when a parent invests in a child, are we together? As the child starts growing and is becoming a responsible child, the parent will start resting. There are parents who have children taller than them and yet they will not rest. You know why? Because the child, with all due respect, is ill-trained and still a burden to the parent. At 40, still a burden. At 50, still a burden. So where the parents would rest, they are not resting because they move from one police station after the other going to bail that child out. This is how it can be. This is not a pastor's conference, but I, I'm just digressing to help you. If you're a man of God here, let me tell you the truth. Don't feel so insecure that you have to turn the attention of everybody on you. It is a risk. You will never be able to find sleep. Help them and guide them and lead them to Jesus. Teach them truth. You are there to supervise, to guide, to coordinate. Are we together? Yeah. Many believers are still carnal. Carnal because of our thinking. Carnal because we are still alive to self. The fleshly desires, we are carnal because we are largely unyielded. To God unyielded to the Holy Spirit. I'm pressing on this carnality so that we'll be able to understand true spirituality. So the natural man is the un unregenerate man. He's not even met Christ at all. Even if he's been around the things of God, he does not have to be a bad man by our definition of being bad, doing anything wrong, society wrong, societally wrong. But the fact that that man is not saved, something is wrong. Eternal damnation is the destiny of that man without Christ. For the carnal man, he is saved, but that the reality, he, is, he cannot be a true reflection of Christ. Are we together? The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. So you watch a carnal man dying as if he is not, spirit, as if he is not saved. And you are wondering, were you really saved? Everything you used to do before you were saved, you are still doing now. No difference. No difference whatsoever. Same talk, same behavior, same places, same relationships, same things. That is a carnally minded man. Same philosophies, same insults, same anger, same manifestations of the flesh. There is nothing around your life. If someone did not see you making an altar call and someone comes to meet you one year even after you are saved, they wouldn't know the difference. You will have to tell them, well, um, just to let you know, I'm saved now. And they say you are saved? It's a joke. But it's supposed to be clear. The reality of salvation is supposed to have a growing influence within you. Is God speaking to someone tonight? Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Uh -huh. Verse 2. It says, Wherein, he's describing something now, Wherein in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world. Watch this. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Are you seeing that there are, there are people in this life you see, the things that they do is not counseling that will change it. They need an altar call. Are we together? It doesn't matter what kind of counseling, with all due respect, you can administer superior therapies. It will not change because there is a spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. 
I've seen people who you counsel and at the point of counseling, they are even crying. And you say, will you do this again? They say, me, no, not at all. In fact, I can tell you today is the last day. That person will get up right where you are and walk right, have you seen that kind of thing? Right there. You can bail the person out of a police station and they'll say, if you return here again, you will not go back. Yes, sir. By the next week, the person is back there. There is a spirit. Please hear me. This is spiritual intelligence. Once you see people doing certain things that they cannot stop, stop wasting your time with counseling. You need to administer another kind of therapy. It's called the power of God. Are we together? Yeah. The person stole 10 naira. You caught the person red-handed with 10 naira there. And the person said, this is the last time. If I do another stealing, may God kill me. God doesn't kill because he knows the man is just talking nonsense. By evening, not the next day, evening. He just sees, and you know these spirits work, these spirits actually create a prophetic expression in their victims. Because you can hide something and the person just stands in the room and just goes to lift the mat. The same way you prophesy. You hide the money, hide it anywhere they will find it. The same way somebody, for instance, not to condemn. All these guys that smoke all kinds of things. As soon as they enter a city, a city they have never gone to, in two hours, they know where their company is. It's a spirit. I know you are laughing, but listen carefully to what I'm telling you. There is a spirit that works in people. The same way there is a spirit that brings trouble, negative things to people. Now, but that is supposed to be the experience of the unbeliever. But you can be a believer. <laughs> Listen, to believe that just because you are saved, demon spirits cannot have access to your mind and your destiny is a joke. Did you hear what I said? Let me repeat it for your learning. It is a joke. They should not. But since you are carnal, there is no difference. So you find out that when you are ministering deliverance, you will see both believers and non-believers under the influence of these spirits. The explanation is provided you still have a carnal software, there is still a gate for Satan to access your life. He may not possess you because the life of God is in your spirit, but he can still find room to manipulate your life even as though you were possessed. So there are many believers moving around and saying it doesn't matter now that I'm safe, I don't need, it's not true. It's not true. Listen to my message, Complete Deliverance. I teach there that there are three levels of deliverance. There is the deliverance where by the power of God, you cast out the spirit influence. Ideally, that should be to an unbeliever. But number two, there is deliverance through transformation. This is what makes deliverance not needed in your life again. That when you sit down and you are transformed, what part of you is being transformed? Your mind. There is a switch from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. And now you can partner as an act of your will with the word of God and with the Holy Spirit. And when Satan comes to you because he will come, there is nothing in you that can connect him to you again. But until then, he would deceive you into believing that you cannot be manipulated by spirits. And yet you will find your life, even though you are saved, you will still find your life helplessly under the influence of spirits. Helplessly. Helplessly under the influence of spirits. And it does not matter whether you are a preacher. It does not matter whether you are a businessman. It does not matter whether you are an elder in church. Spirits don't have respect for those things. Once you are carnally minded, you are in the realm of Satan. There is a way that carnal people walk. It says who walk according to the cause of this world. There is a way carnally minded people speak. There is a way carnally minded people behave. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Just because you have obtained grace from God does not mean you will utilize it. You can waste the grace, the enabling grace that was given. It is why every time Jesus saw people and he had compassion towards them, the first thing he did was to teach them. That means the real way to show people compassion, 
the real way to show people to if you desire to take people out of their state your response is not just a prophetic word your response is not just healing your real response to dealing with people's state is to teach them the teaching ministry is the permanent cure for people's state but then related to the teaching ministry the content the spiritual information that you are communicating must be wholesome doctrinal balanced seasoned with power to produce the effect otherwise you'll be creating another kind of error again which is what is happening sadly across the body of christ so we have many teachers but the content is where the problem is so there are believers who are learning and receiving but the problem is not their refusal to receive is that there is something wrong with the kind of information either it is imbalanced or completely wrong are we together what do you do with a carnal mind what do you do with a carnal person a carnal person needs beyond counseling please let me have your attention a carnal man needs beyond advice a carnal man needs beyond just reading a book what a carnal man needs is to submit himself watch this now to submit himself to the ministry of the word through a teaching priest and then that process of transition begins until he becomes a spiritual man is someone learning now so you find yourself and you know as i'm speaking that truly I'm still in this realm of carnality. My mind is not purified. My thoughts are not purified. So says my speaking. So says my behavior. Because your mindset is what controls your behavior. Your mindset is what controls your speaking. Your mindset is what controls your appetites. And the moment you find out that you are not manifesting God-like characteristics, I am telling you, the diagnosis is that you are carnal, even though you are saved. But there is a way out. In the name of Jesus, there is a way out. Let's talk about the spiritual man. Pray in the spirit in one minute. Pray in the spirit in one minute. Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word and I will forever sing your praise. Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word and I will forever sing your praise. Pray and I will sing of the wonders of your work I will sing out for joy I will sing of the wonders of your work and I will forever sing your praise hallelujah now look up please a spiritual man is not a man open to the realm of the spirit listen carefully when we talk about a spiritual man we don't mean a man who is open to visionary encounters or out of body experiences because an occultic man is not a spiritual man even though he's open to the realm of the spirit so when we are talking about spirituality we are not talking about the ease with which you can separate your body from your spirit and interact with the realm of the spirit. No! If that is your concept, you will easily be misled to error. I want to define for you the spiritual man from the lens of scripture. Because for the average believer, after dealing with the matters of the natural man and dealing with the carnal man, the moment we talk about the spiritual man, the first place your mind goes to is the person who leaves his body at will. If you can leave your body at will, something is wrong with you. Did you hear what I said? 
if you can leave your body, levitate and leave your body at will and come back, go for and see a powerful man of God to help you. I'm telling you this. It's an occultic practice. It's not spirituality. <laughs> you should have the advantage of the duality of realms, of interacting with the realm of the spirit. But let me tell you something. Something always happens to you when you are exposed to the atmosphere of the realm of the spirit. The realm of the spirit is not heaven. I hope you know that. The realm of the spirit is another face, another plane of reality that has rules of engagement accessible to all men with or without Christ. The condition to be out and interacting with the realm of the spirit is that you must be assisted by another spirit and it does not have to be the spirit of God. I will sing of the wonders of your word. I will sing out for joy. I will sing of the wonders of your word. And I will forever sing your praise. What kind of man does the Bible define as a spiritual man? Please write. What kind of a man? If we know that there is the natural man, if we know that there is the carnal man, a believer, and yet a carnal man, and we say that to be able to reflect Christ in his fullness, the condition is that beyond salvation, that transition has to happen in your life until you attain a state, a kind of man that the Bible calls spiritual. Now we're examining such a man. What does it take? How do I know that I am becoming or I have become a spiritual man? Are you ready? There are a few things, features that must be captured within the life of a believer as proof that that person is a spiritual man. Let me run through the list for you. Number one, any spiritual man you know must have encountered Christ through the new birth experience. Any man. This is why I said a spiritual man is not just one who is open to the realm of the spirit. There are many people who are not saved and they can see visions. There are many people who are trained traditionally in the village. And their organs of interaction with the realm of the spirit by fraternity with demon spirits are opened in a heightened way. They can see you coming from a distance and call your name. The lady, the damsel who had the spirit of divination, her prophecy was accurate and yet she was not saved. Are we learning? So for you to be a spiritual man, number one, you must have encountered Jesus Christ through the new birth experience. Please write that down. You must have encountered Christ, Jesus Christ, through the new birth experience. Number two, a spiritual man is one who has had an experience with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a spiritual man if you have not encountered the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. These are the factors that produce true spirituality in believers. Number one, an experience with Jesus, the son of the living God, the new birth experience. Number two, an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Can I give you number three? The factors that define a spiritual man. A spiritual man is one who has a thorough comprehension of the principles of the kingdom as revealed in scripture. A thorough comprehension of the principles of the kingdom, the ways of God as revealed in scripture. Don't forget this third point. A spiritual man is not just a Bible study giant. 
is one who through the lens of scripture primarily has come into a thorough comprehension of the ways of God, the principles of the kingdom as revealed in scripture. You have that down? So number one, an encounter with Jesus Christ through the new birth experience. Number two, an encounter with the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, a thorough comprehension of the principles of the kingdom, the ways of God as revealed in scripture. Number four, who is a spiritual man according to scripture? Number one, number four, the man who has willingly chosen to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Ah, this is an important one. The man who has willingly chosen to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Just because you have an encounter with God by His Spirit does not mean you have chosen to submit. A spiritual man is one who has willingly underlined that word will. Your will has an active role to play in your becoming spiritual. Willingly submitted to the Lordship, the leadership of the Spirit of God. Mm. Let me tell you the truth. Do you know how difficult it is to truly submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> when you submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the first thing that happens is a thorough disruption of life as you have defined it your way. Did you hear what I said? A thorough disruption of life as you have defined or arranged it your way. When God comes into your life, he does not continue with your life the way you designed it. There is a disruption of that plan. It's the reason why many people cannot submit to the Spirit of God. Because you have pledged loyalty to God by his Spirit. I will go. I will go. Wherever you lead me. I will go. I will go, I will go, wherever you lead me. This is the reason why God likes songs of surrender, because he will answer them quickly. You know, all these songs we sing, God, take everything. Say, aha, uh -huh, this is what I've been waiting for. But you see, because the Spirit of God is not a demon spirit, at every point in his leadership journey with you, he will have to verify that you are still willing to trust him. Did you hear what I said? He will not usurp it over you. No. I'm willing to guide you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit is based on the understanding that God's ways are not your ways. Neither his thoughts your thoughts. Are we together? That you can want life your way. Ah, but if you can trust God. Let me tell you the truth. The initial point of your journey with the Holy Spirit will be rough. And it is not rough because that's how he leads. It is rough because of the bad plans you have made for yourself. That in your own wisdom you believe you have designed an excellent life. Here he comes. Spirit of the living God. Ah. I love the Holy Spirit too. When he steps into your life. You who is thinking politics, politics. Me I know I will win the election. He just comes upon you. And gently he starts doing a U-turn. And for some people it's 180 degrees. Are we together? Let me tell you what it means to submit to the Holy Spirit. To submit your will. To submit your plans. To submit your ways. And to be willing to receive from him. Even if it is inconveniencing you. You trust the fact that he represents, he is the spirit of the father and that he has your best interest. 
It may not make sense, but somewhere along the journey, after 10 years, you will see the wisdom of his leadership. Someone, please listen to me. Because one of the ways carnal people get into trouble is judging 10 years using the myopic lens of today. God can look at you and tell you, join this chariot. It may not make sense till after 11 years. You will see why he brought you to that relationship. You will see why he brought you to Koinonia. The version of you that came may not make sense. God, what are you doing with me? And he says, you just be consistent. When he calls you to enter the ark, it's because the rain is coming. And just because the rain did not come for 120 years, be patient. When the rain comes, you will see the value of that wisdom.